Mr. Taylor as he brings the word. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. So glad that you're here. Hope you're having a great weekend. We went to the uh, uh, Linden Lighted Christmas Parade yesterday, and I remembered why I haven't done that in a decade, because freaking freezing cold. But it was amazing. Such a good time. It's Christmas season, guys. Tis the season to be merry. And hey, we got good news in church today. Jesus is the king of the kingdom that is unshakable. He is present. He is moving. There is power in this room to change your life, to wreck your life in the best way possible. We're going to see if we can build you up and strengthen you in the midst of a world that's just bent on tearing you down and discouraging you. So if I haven't met you, my name's Taylor. I'm the lead pastor here. We are doing a verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of Mark. We're picking up our study in uh, verse 14, doing two verses today, 14 and 15 of Mark chapter 1. We're getting into some, uh, it's going to be a bit all over the place today, guys, but you guys are used to that with me anyways. We're talking about the gospel, talking about Jesus, the kingdom. We're going to hit on Balenciaga, Kanye West maybe. I don't know. We'll see where this goes. It's going to be a great Sunday, and I'm stoked that you're here. Let's jump into what God's Word has to say for, uh, to us today. It says this in, in verse 14, now after John was a Arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, this, of course, is in context of what we were talking about last week. Jesus has officially began his ministry. He spent 40 days immediately in the wilderness, fasting and praying, squaring off with Satan himself. TKO's the devil after not eating a meal in over 30 days. And part of what's going on here through the wilderness temptation, right? Jesus baptized, Holy Spirit descends. He's empowered for ministry. First thing he does is he squares off with the spirit spiritual enemy. He doesn't do anything public. And part of what Jesus is teaching us that we need to pay attention to, and I just feel like somebody needs to be reminded of this again today. Listen, your enemy is not flesh and blood. Jesus is modeling something for us here. And he's saying the true enemy is a spiritual enemy. And and behind the evil and the chaos in society and at the level of the soul, we talked about this last week, is an immaterial but very intelligent, real and powerful force that Jesus calls Satan. I want to talk about this for just a couple more minutes, make some exit commentary, and we'll move on to our text today. Paul the Apostle in Ephesians 6, again, he says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. People are not your enemy. In in fact, this is why... uh, uh, Christians, in fact, have been honorable even in the midst of horribly corrupt uh, societies and cultures. You've got Peter, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, probably one of the most epic verses in the entire Bible. He says this, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. The emperor that he's referring to right there is the current residing emperor of uh, Rome in the time of this writing, who was Nero. Now, what you need to understand about Nero is he was taking Christians, fastening them them to poles and lighting them on fire to entertain his dinner guests, right? The dude's a piece of work, all right? And and here the apostle Peter is saying, hey, even in the midst of that type of societal, governmental corruption and evil, I still want you as the people of God to honor. Why? What's he saying? He's saying that the true enemy is a spiritual enemy. Uh, And and, and so, so we talked about last week about how, you know, like the primary way that Satan is going to work in the world is in the context of lies, right? And so we've got a current example of this that I just really feel impressed to do some commentary on. Again, we, uh, if you've been here for any length of time, we don't tend to beat around the bush with some stuff. We kind of like to plow the bush over and burn it to the ground. So let me do that with kind of one of our cultural issues going on right now. For those of you, if you haven't heard about the Balenciaga scandal, welcome out from under the rock you're living under. It's disgusting. It's repulsive. It's child abuse. Essentially what happened is they did a photo shoot with uh, toddlers, right? We're talking like two, three, four-year-old kids. They're posing them with teddy bears wearing bondage gear, all right? This is, this is literally, they're putting these teddy bears uh, in gear that porn sites are making billions of dollars off of, right? And this is absolutely horrific what we saw happen this last week. And the question is that we need to ask, it's okay, so we have this happening. There seems to be an uprising, culturally speaking, about that. Everybody's mad about it, and rightfully so. But the question is, how 
did we even get there, right? Because if you go back 100 years ago, nobody's even thinking about putting those two realities together. So how did we get here? I'm reading this really fascinating book called uh, Car- uh, The Rise and the Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. And his point is, is listen, 100, like, like we, this is a domino effect. This isn't just an event that happened in a vacuum. We had stuff kick off several hundred years ago that we're now eating the fruit of. This wasn't just an event that happened in a vacuum. This has been a long process to get to this point. He makes the argument in the book, hey, look, modern identities is shaped by primarily individual and psychological terms, meaning this is where we get our identity as modern people in the Western world. I am, and this is what's so dangerous, I am what's going on in my head. That, that's where we tend to gather our, our, our individual identities. And so we've moved to also at the same time primarily think of ourselves in profoundly sexual terms, Truman says in his book, meaning I am most reflective of my individual sexual preference and identity. And so because of the value that we have on the therapeutic and my individual psychological reality, it's given rise, and hear me now, this is the scary part, to the breaking down of any sort of cultural guardrails that were once in place to keep us from Balenciaga taking pictures with kids holding teddy bears and bondage gear, right? That's the point, that this has been a long process to get us to this point. Truman, in his book, he's like, listen, this is what y'all need to understand. This is the logical further working process of all of this, right? And here's what we've done, guys. This is what we've done. We've blown up marriage culturally. We've blown up male and female. Now we have gender spectrum. We're allowing and encouraging children to mutilate their bodies. We're sexualizing them at a young age through indoctrination in schools, and there's no, uh, and so what we found out is we've come to this demonic realization that if all you have is tolerance and diversity and no sexual guardrails and protocols, you end up abusing kids, right? And so part of the point is, hey, look, if your worldview's broke, trash it and get a new one, right? And this is, this is the good news of Jesus in a moment like this, is we can actually do that, right? Because there's something in us that's looking at this and saying, man, there's something wrong with this. There's something evil about this and even demonic. And the point is, it's, that's, that's true. Why? Why is that even there in the midst of a culture that's deconstructed all of these realities? Why is that even there? That shouldn't even be there, but it is. Why? It's because God gave you a conscience, Right, He gave you a conscience. There is a God to whom we're morally accountable. He wrote a book called the Bible that says sex is confined to a covenant marriage of one man and one woman. You get rid of that as a category. You descend inevitably to where we are at today. That's the point. Now, here's the thing. Why do I even bring that up and uh, uh, take a risk of making some people really mad at me? Let me tell you why, okay? Here's why. The director... The, the concert master, the orchestrator behind all of that, Jesus is gonna say, it's a spiritual reality, right? It's the Satan, right? Jesus' answer to the church then in the middle of that, what we need to pay attention to last week, you know what it is? It's not to despair, it's to get desperate. It's not to panic, it's to pray. It's not to get cynical, come on somebody, but to cry out to the God of heaven, to meet Jesus in the wilderness of fasting and of prayer. Because here's the thing, guys, let me just say this, and I really mean this, and I'm more convinced than I ever have been. It is revival or we die. It is the outpouring of the spirit, the renewal of the culture through the in breaking kingdom of God, or we are absolutely bankrupt. Listen, I'm telling you, there's never been a better time for you to be alive and for you to be following Jesus where there's bad news. Listen, we got a lot of good news. There is a king and his name is Jesus. You are his A-team and he seems to be okay with that. He's not freaking out. And so the call of God then is, hey, church, royal priesthood, right? This is a part of what it means to be the royal priesthood, to meet with Jesus in his house of prayer and to contend for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in the earth because it's God who said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, come on now, somebody help me, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. 
This is what we're holding out for, right? This is what God wants to do. And here's the tension of all of this, by the way. Uh, it's not enough to just be a person of prayer and in the wilderness praying, fasting with Jesus. Right? Did you know that? There's actually a second part of this, and we see this right off the, out of the gate here in our text today, is, is Jesus is also calling us to be a people of proclamation. And this is a picture of a full and rounded Christian, is one who moves in and out with Jesus from the place of prayer and the place of proclamation. And let me just tell you, this, that's where you find the place of power. This is where the church becomes a powerhouse, is when the church prays and when the church proclaims the true gospel. This is where you and your family and your home becomes a powerhouse, is when there's prayer and there's proclamation. This is when we see the kingdom of God advance in powerful ways through us as the people of God, is when there is prayer, faithful prayer, desperation before God, and faithful proclamation uh, in the church to the world around us. Now, it, it, it's not... we. So we need to be well-rounded here. And part of the question is with this is where are you gonna be strongest and weakest? Because we all are at different levels with both prayer and with proclamation. So maybe you hear you're just a prayer person. You're just like, all I do is pray and that's good and that's legit and that's my ministry. And what Jesus would say to you is, hey, we need to actually balance the scales. You need to become more of a person of proclamation. Or maybe you're just like a just flaming hot evangelist and just tell everybody about Jesus and you're not super strong on the prayer part. It, Jesus is saying, listen, my life, what it's meant to do to you is give you an example of what it means to be uh, a, a Christian, and, and I'm moving in and out of the place of prayer and of proclamation. So where are you at, and what do we need to supplement? And guys, this is our language of praying missional community, right? We did a whole fall series on this because we really, truly believe that there is hope for Bellingham. Come on, there's hope for the Pacific Northwest. Come on, somebody, there's hope for Washington and the United States of America. And if we can become Jesus' vision of a praying missional community, we are going to see the world around us transformed and renewed from the inside. Now, here's a part of the point of proclamation. The implication is that people are not just going to come to Jesus intuitively. I don't know if you know that, but it's true. People do not come to Christ intuitively. You have to preach something. You have to proclaim something. And this is the classic party guy that says, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm a Christian now. And and all I got to do is if I bake my friends enough cookies and DD enough for them, then they're going to find out one day miraculously that I'm a Christian and say, I want to give my life to Christ. But that's not how it works, right? Your friends, listen, your friends are not going to just wake up and come to you after you make them X amount of cookies and say, hey, you know what? I realized something through your generosity and your kindness. I'm a depraved sinner. I need the second person of the Godhead to come down, live the life that I couldn't, die a substitutionary death on the cross in my place. So by faith, and repentance in him, I can be saved. Help me. You know, like they're not gonna do that, right? That's the point. Something actually has to be proclaimed. And so then the question is, well, what do we actually proclaim? And Jesus, he's showing us, like literally it's right there. And he's gonna call this the gospel, all right? And uh, we've seen this three times in Mark chapter one. And this is what Jesus proclaimed, and so this is what you and I need to saturate our souls with and to love, to come to understand, and to cherish. Listen, here's a part of my burden as a pastor. For many Christians, the gospel is the ABCs of Christianity. And what we need to understand is, no, 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 listen, it's the A to Z of the Christian life. This is what's gonna sustain you. This is what's going to bring transformation in your life and continual transformation to your life and through your life, it's the gospel. And so this is what Jesus gets after in verses 14. Look at, uh, I wanna focus on one term here in verse 15. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We got a brand new theme here, and it's this idea of the kingdom of God. Now, let's take a few minutes to talk about this because this is really important. I think a lot of the reason why we don't get Jesus in the modern world or where he's confusing for us is because we don't understand this idea of the kingdom of God. This is central to Jesus' ministry. This is central to the why behind his life. And this idea of the kingdom of God, it needs to become central to your idea. And Jesus calls it a gospel. He says, this is a gospel. Now, right, that word gospel, what does it mean? Good news that causes great joy. That this is something that should cause joy to erupt into the world. Right, Christmas season, guys, joy to the world, right? Some of you are just looking like you're just 
depressed right now. Smile, like Jesus came. He's alive and he loves you, all right? It's good news, right? And this is, this is a good news message that he came with. And Jesus is saying, listen, it's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about the kingdom of God. Here's the thing, there's so much bad news in the world. It's like every day you're hearing from your crazy friends and from the news, everything's bad and it's getting worse. Amen, anybody resonate with that? It's like that scene in SpongeBob where you have Squidward and the pineapple house falls on him and he thinks the whole world's ending. He's like, oh my gosh, the world's ending. You know, store up on water invest in gold. He's like freaking out. That's literally been the proverbial experience of what it looks like to be a citizen in the Western world since 2020 kicked off. Amen? Right? That's what it's actually been like for us. There's so much bad news everywhere. And what's really interesting, I was thinking about this this last week. I spent a lot of times in coffee shops locally. And uh, I, and if you've ever wondered, you've ever been in a coffee shop conversation, you're like, man, is anybody, is anybody listening? You know, you're kind of like looking around. I have these really great headphones. They're soundproof headphones. What I can do is I can turn them into a wear mode and I can spy on your conversation. So yes, that guy exists, all right? And here's the point. When I'm in these different coffee shops, and listening to conversations. Guys, here's what I found. People don't get together to talk about why stuff is so awesome, do they? No, it's like you get these groups of people, hey, let's get some coffee. Okay, yeah, sounds great. And then they just talk about how horrible the world is. It's like, oh my gosh, recession and all oh, the real estate market and 7% and, you know, and, and Putin and, and China. Don't forget China. What about China? And Kanye, right? Yay, what's going on, everybody, with yay? He's just having a public mental breakdown. It's horrible. But it's like we talk about what's going wrong in the world, right? For those of you that you work in a labor job, right? You're just like, everybody's always right. Oh, man, everything sucks. You know, it's just everybody is, and I don't think it's just labor jobs. It's everybody. That's the point. We, there's so much bad news in the world. The question is, is there good news anywhere? Listen, you and I, we need good news. Maybe maybe you personally, you've been the recipient of some personal bad news this year. Maybe you, like my family, have received the worst news that you ever have in your life this last year. Maybe for you, bad news is actually very personal. Here's the thing about holiday seasons, guys. This is what we know. Uh, the holidays are like emotions on steroids, aren't they? <laughs> the bad's worse and the good's better. It's, it's, so for some of you, this time of year, it actually carries a, a lot of emotional baggage and pain. You just got bad news. And the question is, is there good news anywhere to which Jesus is gonna break into the scene? First words in red, guys, are all about the gospel. Jesus is like, man, I, got, I have good news for you. You and I need good news. And Jesus says the good news is all about the kingdom of God. What does he say about the kingdom of God? Why is it, why is it good news? Look at this phrase with me again. First words of Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Look at your neighbor and say the kingdom is now. Now look at the other one that you didn't pick that you don't like and say the kingdom's now. All right, let's just keep it even. Let's keep it fair. Everybody gets a participation award in church today. We believe in equality here, all right? Make sure nobody's left out. Here's the thing. Jesus is saying the kingdom of God, why this is good news, is because it's at hand. It's present. It's in your very midst. Listen, this is what changes your life moving forward. Well, you got to understand contextually, the Jewish people, they were waiting for some sort of major eschatological moment when God would come back to earth and usher in his kingdom reign, that there was going to be salvation for the people of God. There was going to be judgment for the wicked. There was going to be God's spirit present, very real, tangible, manifest ways. There was going to be restoration and renewal, forgiveness of sin, transformation, God was gonna bring us back into his presence and save us forever as his people as he ushers in the eternal reign of his kingdom. And so the Jewish people, for hundreds and thousands of years, they're waiting, 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 waiting. And okay, God, now would be a great time for you to do something. Uh, we're super busted up and we've got Roman oppression and we're poor and we're oppressed and stuff is difficult and you know, we're, we're not an autonomous nation. We need you to show up. We're waiting. Would you do something if you ever felt like that in your life? And all the single people in church said, amen. God, I'm still single. Send him my way. Send her my way, right? This is what we get in this place of, of waiting and just, oh God, like fulfill your promise. And that's where the Jewish people was. And Jesus bursts open on the scene. The first words that he says is, hey guys, that far off distant day that you're waiting for, the kingdom of God, right? The biblical writers would refer to this as the day of the Lord. He's like, it's here, 
right? It's at hand. The kingdom of God is now in your very midst. Now, here's the question. Why could he say that? This is what's so offensive to you and to me and to the modern mind. Why could he say the kingdom of God is at hand? You wanna know why? It's because he's the king. He's the king of God's kingdom. But I'm gonna even take this a step further. What's going on implicitly in the text? He's God. He is the God of the kingdom. And th here's what we need to realize, guys. And let me just say this for just a couple brief moments here, point this out. If that's true, that demands something of your life, doesn't it? If Jesus, because and it's part of my heart and my prayer as we continue to go through the gospel of Mark, I am trying to absolutely destroy that idea in your mind that Jesus can just be a nice guy who said some cool stuff a couple thousand years ago, that he's just a nice teacher about you living a moral and an upright life and loving your neighbor. What Mark just did, what Jesus just did, is he blew up your whole paradigm of who Jesus is, and he says, no, he's the king of the kingdom, right? He is the capital K king. He is the Lord of Lords, the king of kings, the ruler of all ruled world rulers. Like every single person, the book of Revelation is gonna say, will bend the knee before him and confess that he is God's king and God's Christ. That is where we are all heading. Right, that's the reality. This is who Jesus is. And, and so he's the king of God's kingdom and he, because he's God, he is the one true God. Daryl Johnson is gonna talk about the kingdom of God like this, really helpful definition, because here's the, you know, for us in, the, uh, in 2022, when we think of the idea of kingdom, uh, we get really weird. We think like castles and moats and Heath Ledger, Knight's Tale, which is still probably one of the best movies ever produced. Can I get an amen from somebody in church? All right, that has good movie taste. All right, the rest of you, altar call right now. <laughs> this is what we tend to think. It's castles, it's most moats, it's archaic, it's, I don't really understand this. I, but here's what Daryl Johnson says to help it make sense. The kingdom of God refers to the dynamic reality of God acting as king. The kingdom of God is where God's will is actually reality. Okay, that's what the idea of the kingdom of God is. And the rest of the gospel of Mark, this is what I love about the book. Mark, what he's gonna do is he's gonna show you what that means and why that's true, right? And let me even take it a step farther. What he's gonna do is he's gonna show you why you want it to be true. This is what I love about Christianity. This is why I'm still on fire for God 10 years into this thing, man, because Christianity is not only true, I want it to be, like, because it's, 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 it, it's the one thing that makes sense in the marketplace of all of the ideas that we currently have at our disposal. The Balenciaga thing that I just deconstructed a few minutes ago, great example. That's where the modern secular worldview is getting us. Christianity is the one thing that is true. It's the one thing that works. And Mark is gonna help us see, listen, this isn't only true, but you want it to be. And, and part of his main point is, listen, regardless of whether you like it or not, his kingdom is going to win out in the end. So what we're gonna see as we continue to navigate through Mark's gospel is every time Jesus heals the sick, he's proving the kingdom of God is at hand. Why? Is there sickness in, in heaven around God's throne right now? There is not. Every time that Jesus forgives and restores a sinner, transforms their heart, it is the kingdom of God coming to the here and the now through the person of, and work of Jesus. Is there depression, anxiety before God's throne in heaven right now? There is not. Every time Jesus comforts a mourner, it is the kingdom of God breaking into the here and the now as he comforts them in John 11 with the reality of resurrection life, eternal life secured through his life, his death, and his resurrection. Is there mourning in God's throne room right now? There is not, right? In fact, Revelation 21 and 22 says that God's gonna come back, guys, and he's gonna wipe every tear from your eyes if you're in Christ. There's gonna be no more death. There's gonna be no more sickness. There's not gonna be any more pain or sorrow or loss anymore. That that is the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Every time that Jesus shows up and ministers healing and deliverance to fallen, broken people. This is the kingdom of God breaking into the here and the now. Now, why I wanna talk about this, well, number one is because Jesus is forcing me to today, but I love it because here's a part of what we get wrong. And, and, and part of the challenge and, 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 and just 
exhortation I just sensed from the Holy Spirit this last week is to just get up here. And I just wanna tell you this, man. Like, listen, here's what we need to understand, guys. The kingdom of God is at hand. Like, it's here. Do you get that? Don't say yes, because we don't, right? But do we, do we, do we actually get this? Like, God's kingdom is actually at hand. It's really actually here. It really is taking ground. Now, what does that mean? Listen, this is, what, this is where you need to find a lot of hope and encouragement today. Because why? Because that means that there is power right now to transform your life. Listen, you, you don't follow, serve, and worship a dead king. He's a resurrected king, right? His first throne was a cross, and the one he's permanently seated on is a white throne, where he rules over the nations of the earth. He ultimately will bring his kingdom to bear on the earth, right? Like this is, this is, and his kingdom is advancing. It's at hand, and in fact, we've had just, it, one of my great joys as a pastor, probably greatest, is just I get a front row seat at seeing God's kingdom break into people's lives and transform them. In fact, we've got an incredible uh, testimony video I wanna play for you in just a second, because here's a part of our conviction, guys. It's like, we can't, you can't just study something like this and be like, oh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's power with this thing, right? Like that's what we need to get back to. Like this was never meant to be something where preachers get up and, oh, the kingdom of heaven. See, this is what the biblical systematic theology, like, like, yeah, that's great. There's a place for that. But here's the deal. God never intended for the message of the kingdom to be devoid of power. So let's roll this video. I wanna show you Alexa's testimony. Jesus in that moment. And when we started to talk about the woman at the well, I felt myself 
sit up and, and I felt like embraced. I felt like I was being hugged for the first time in my whole life. And I was able to walk out of Pastor Taylor's home with my shoulders back like I wasn't hiding from viewing God above me. It was He was with me and he was embracing me, telling me that was worthy of his presence. Life's been joyful for the first time in over a year, and I don't feel hopeless or helpless. I have a relationship that I'm cultivating with Jesus that I can turn to now in these moments where I feel that void opening up. My chronic pain has gotten incredibly better. I have not been able to say that I've gone weeks or months without migraines. This is the first time I've gone over three weeks without having a horrific migraine attack, which is something I thought would never happen last year, I thought this was going to become my life, and the shame and guilt is something I don't have to carry anymore, it's completely out of my body, and I, I don't have a shadow with me anymore, I feel like Jesus is proud of me and where I'm going and how much our relationship has blossomed, and I see him as a friend and a father, and I've never been able to see him like that before now. Amazing. What's the point? Guys, the kingdom of God is at hand. There is power to transform your life. And, and what's interesting, I was actually thinking about this first service. I wanna bring it up again um, because for many of us, what happened, because I, I know kind of the background of many of us here at New Song and where we come from. And whenever a message like this gets preached, for those of us that come from more of a conservative Christian background, we get a little bit nervous, right? Because I'm sure you've heard of the idea of the kingdom of God is an already but not reality. And yes, that is true. But here, what I feel like Jesus is saying to many of us today is, listen, guys, we took that way too far. And what we did is we allowed that idea to downplay and downgrade the amount of faith that we can have for God to move today. I feel this invitation from Jesus to just step into his ministry and just say, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's this amazing uh, part in uh, the Lord of the Rings, the book. Worship team, you guys can go ahead and come on up. Community team, come on up here. Where in the book, several people, they end up getting wounded, right? They're poisoned by their enemy's weapons and they're, they're getting sicker and sicker and it's looking really bad. And a nurse recalls a legend from Gondor that, that goes like this. This is beautiful. She said, the hands of the king are healing hands and so shall the rightful king be known. Guys, that's what's going on here. Like that's the whole point today, isn't it? This is, this is the good news that causes great joy about the kingdom of God, that Jesus' hands are healing hands. And listen, I know we got pain in this room. It would take us hours to exegete and talk through everybody's stories and everything that you brought into this space today, personal pain, suffering, loss, difficulty. This time of year might be especially difficult for many of us. Maybe you're just feeling the angst and the weight of what we're currently still navigating through culturally and there's pain. And let me tell you this, this is how you're gonna know the hands of the king. They're healing hands. Jesus' hands are healing hands. The point is that we've been wounded, guys, by sin, by suffering, by pain, and we are only getting more sick. There's no anecdote, right? There's none. You can keep trying to find it, self-medicate with whatever. What you're doing is you're trying to fill a divine need with a temporal, temporary reality. There's no anecdote. We're all screwed up and messed up and there's no hope apart from Jesus. The good news of the gospel of the kingdom is this. Listen, it doesn't matter how messed up you are, how broken you are, how dysfunctional you are, how jacked up your life is and how jacked up your world is. The king hands for you and I today are healing hands. His hands are healing hands. They're the, they're the only hands that can really bring healing to your life. And Tim Keller would say it like this. He would say that Jesus's hands, and this is the whole idea of the communion table, the cross that we're gonna celebrate again together at the communion table today. He would say this, that Jesus's hands were pierced with nails for you so you could be pierced with his love. 
You see why this is good news? Right? And so the question is then, how do you get in on it? Because there should be something on the inside of every single one of us rising up like, oh, I wondered if this was real. I wondered if there was that kind of love. I wondered if there was that kind of hope that I could have that for, for transformation in my life and a hope that would even transcend the immediate transformation in my life that would be rooted in eternity so much so that even if stuff doesn't go my way, that I could walk through life differently because I know that the King Jesus, Jesus the King wins out in the end. How do I actually get in on that, right? Hopefully that's rising up on the inside of every single one of us. Jesus says it right at the end of verse 15. We might have missed it. What does he say? It's this simple. Repent and believe in the gospel. <laughs> that's it, guys. This is where Christianity is fundamentally different from every other religion or worldview, even secularism, because Christianity is first news before it's advice. Jesus has good news for you, not good advice first. The good, the good news, when it grips your heart, it transforms your life so you begin to live differently. But first and foremost, he didn't come with the manual of good advice. The start of the whole gospel narrative is you and I are too messed up. We can't save ourselves. That's what Advent is all about. That's what the Christmas season is all about. Hey, y'all, we couldn't figure it out, and we needed God, God to figure it out for us. Christianity is first and foremost about news ever before it's about advice. You ever have the, those moments where somebody's giving you advice or like you're listening to a podcast, and it's like, man, like here's the neuroscience of why you should get up at 4 a.m. and get every, your day straightened out, your life straightened out, and you're just like, whoa, that's awesome. And then you try the next day, and you fail because you suck at it, right? And, and you just get discouraged and crushed by it. Some of you are just so confrontational. Someone tries to get you advice and you're just like, who are you? You know, like, like it becomes crushing and discouraging. And Jesus shows up and he's like, man, I don't first have good advice for you. I have got good news for you. Like, yeah, you got sin on you. Yeah, that sin alienated you from God. But my hands were pierced with nails so you could be pierced with the love of God. So my hope for us, church family today, is that as we take communion together this morning, that you would let the goodness of God saturate your soul, that his hands were pierced with nails so your soul could be pierced and saturated with God's love. Would you stand with me? I wanna, I wanna pray for us. God, I pray right now for the gift of repentance. This isn't a moralistic thing. This is the changing of the mind, God. We need to think about you differently. We need to think about life and flourishing and how we're gonna get there differently. This isn't a sad, somber, God, your brow is furrowed in our direction and you're frustrated and angry with us. You have a smile on your face today. And you're saying, repent, change your mind. I'm who you are looking for. Jesus is the king that you've been looking for, and it's not you. God, would you, Father, I pray, any area where we are individually holding on to autonomy in our lives from your lordship and your kingship, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you give such a grace to recognize, man, if Jesus is gonna go to the cross for me, I can trust him in every area of my life. Pray for repentance. And Jesus, just like you also said, faith, repent and believe in the good news of the kingdom of God. Father, that your kingdom is advancing. Jesus, you are taking, this isn't a moment to despair and to become a cynic and discouraged and wall up and shelter in place as the people of God, but to actually have our faith cranked and to move into the world to seek its transformation and renewal from within because you have all authority in heaven and on the earth. God, I pray that you would make us a people of faith. Great, big, crazy, off the wall, bet the farm faith here at this church to really believe that you are the God of the impossible. Lord, we just say there's too much unbelief in our hearts. As we reflect on the cross, we remember that you suffered, you bled, and you died. You resurrected from death, eternally victorious. 
you are the God of the impossible. So we step into this moment of repentance and faith and we thank you for who you are, that you really are who you say you are. God, would you come and minister to your people? I pray this would be a moment of just encounter. Lord, that it would be a moment of Jesus, you coming as the good shepherd to comfort those here that are mourning. Those of us navigating through a difficult moment in life, would you come and bring your comfort to bear in this moment as we reflect on your hands pierced with nails. Would you pierce our hearts with your love in Jesus' name? Everybody said, amen. All right.